All right, so a professor of mine who I learned to respect um, at seminary said, you know, there are these Bibles they call, they have these, uh, the words in different colors, especially Jesus' words are all in red letters. And he, he just slowed us down as we were moving really fast in the class, and I should take this lesson today, slow down, say, you know, if Jesus said them, they're probably worth taking a look at. If Jesus spoke them, they were probably well thought out and were fulfilling more than just a dialogue or a conversation. And in the song that we have today, it's called Red Letters by, by Dave Crowder, and it basically starts out by talking about how guilty he feels for being a sinner and how awful he feels in his life, but then he reads the words of Jesus. He reads the red letters. So maybe you can relate as we have our opening song called Red Letters. Thank you. 
In Bible class, this, between the services, we had an opportunity to talk about the sin that so easily entangles us, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we begin our service. But before we do that, I'd like to have an opening with you, a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you brought us to this gathering. This day is a gift. Never promised, but now is upon us. We ask that we would use it wisely, just like the talents given to those faithful servants who took it and did the best they could with what they were given. Help us in all that we do and say, give you honor and glory. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. May our hearts be open to hear that word that you have in store for us this morning. I pray this in the holy, precious name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, I've done things a little different. I'd love to have this up there just for a while before we really get started singing, John, because, uh, nope, band stays here. Yeah. Because um, we got something going on here. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All right, so this is a pretty profound statement. I'd like you to say this out loud with me. Let's say it together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I'm not as bad as the gal or the guy next to me. I'm not as bad as the people that are in the news. I'm not as evil. I'm not as sin-filled. But absolutely we are. As it was analogized, it was a, a vase that was filled with water. And you say, well, what's in there? It's pure water. It's clean. You put one drop of red in, what, what happens to the water? Well, it becomes red. Red is infused in our very nature, and that's the sin. And if you think sin's not part of you, you're wrong. You're wrong. It's a very big part of what's going on in our world. But, as I'm so excited to be able to say, the H2O is actually separate from the red. We just can't tell. So sin impacts our lives, but that is not God intended you to be. But without Jesus Christ, we are nothing. And so, as we meditate, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us this morning. With thankful hearts, we can sing this next song, I am nothing without you, and it's in his mercy that we find his grace. So we'll sing that, and then we'll move on to the actual confession. Thank you. 
ourselves the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins God who is faithful and just say with me will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we turn to the Lord right now right here in this place and we confess to you God our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ that we are indeed sinners sinners because we're in, we have inherited original sin and, and sinners because we commit actual sins. But we sin, Lord, in a wanting way. We may not be thinking about it, but we are really asking you to step out of our lives, step away from us so that we can do what our heart wants, what our desires want. But no, 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 Lord, we, we don't want you to be gone from us. And so for those sins, we, we heartfelt confession. We are sorry for the sins of our thoughts, our words, and our actions. You've called us to love one another in a way that you've loved. With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, you've called us to love you, but also to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we have failed in that degree as well. We've cut other people off. We've put other people down. We failed to come to church. We failed to put you first in our time, our talents, and our treasures. We keep putting that God in front of you, and that God is ourselves. And we confess that, and we ask for your forgiveness. We seldom recognize the abilities and the opportunities that you give us. Help us to use those opportunities to glorify your name. We're so used to the darkness. Help us to put aside that darkness and to live in the light. For other sins, Lord, that we know in our hearts now, I ask you to hear from their hearts to the foot of the cross as they place those sins upon at the foot, Lord. They wish to be forgiven of those to confess their sins. Hear my brothers and sisters now during this time of silence as they do just that, confess those particular sins. this in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen. I have in front of me just a few words that we almost always hear during Christmas time. The favor of the Lord is upon you. And, and uh, we understand that because Mary was chosen by God to carry the, the child, the Christ child. And so that's what made her favor. What makes you favor is God has chosen you to have your names written in the book of life, to be forgiven and set free. And Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for each and every one of you. And for His sake, He forgives you all of your sins. And now as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive all of your sins in that name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus and pass the peace of God to one another at this time. Stand and, and share that now. Is there music on this one? No music? I guess not. I don't know. All this
for a children's message at this time. I've got something special planned for them. So they can make it up here. Go ahead and sit on the stairs there. We'll be good to go. It's kind of simple, but I'm hoping you can clear, you know, make it clear for everyone that's listening, okay? So I've got a couple things with me, and you might have seen me wear this before, but I've got a reason for wearing this. If I'm wearing this, maybe I have an orange vest, which I didn't bring today, and I'm wearing this, what do you think I do? Beetle. Beetle. No, Bill. I don't, I'm not a beetle. Bill. Bill? Did you say Bill? Yes, I'm a builder. I'm a worker in construction. What if, uh, how would I look if I was a, a policeman? What would I, how would you know I'm a policeman if I walk up to you? What? Yeah? A star. Oh, but a star? On my head? You mean, oh, a badge. I have a badge, I have a uniform, right? It, what if, I, how would you know if I walked up to you and I was a fireman? How would you know? I know I put fires out, but how do you know I'm a fireman if I were to walk up to you? You're wearing red and, and um, a fire on your hat. I got the helmet thing, and I got a different kind of clothes. And yes, so all of those things show us who we are. If, if I'm holding a guitar, you should probably think I'm a guitar player, right? Make sense? All the things that we do, we dress up for, and that's what we do. We have a uniform that tells us what we do. Well, today we're going to be talking about the things that God has called us to do, and how do we do those things? So a fireman puts fires out, right? Policemen arrest people and they serve and protect, right? And a construction person builds something. Can you think of anybody else that wears a uniform and what they might do? Yeah, you got one? Teachers, yes. Sometimes teachers wear certain clothes when they're teaching. A, a nurse, they, they look different. The doctors look different when they're working. Any other, any other jobs, yes? Chefs, yeah, they, they, they look different too. I thought I'm on. Oh, I'm muted. Yeah, that's better. So all of those things that they tell us what I do. So does a chef go arrest people? No. Does a fireman go arrest people, usually? No, no. Uh, does a doctor um, cook food for everybody? No. So whatever they're, they're called to do, that's what they do. And they wanted to, we wanted them to do it really, really well. So you're a girl, you're a boy, you guys are sons or daughters of somebody, you might be a brother or a sister. And so, and how many of you are in school? You're all in school. Wow. So when you're in school, you're supposed to be a student and learn, right? And we're supposed to do that as the best that we can. And so today we're going to be talking about when God gives you certain um, abilities. You're to do it as best you can. So you're, you've got to be the best son, the best daughter, the best student you could possibly be. That means that everything that God has given everyone in the church here today, we're going to be the best that God has called us to be. And that's what we call our calling. And in Tuesday morning Bible class, I wrote up on the board, your vocation, that's your calling, is not a vacation. And, uh, you know, so when you're called to do something, it means you're called to do what God has done. And we have a lot of people here that are very talented. I want to end with this. Do you have any other talents? Are you, can you do something that's really kind of neat that you know how to do that maybe other one people don't? Yeah? Um, my talent is to help kids and help people take care of kids. You're a good Wow, that's wonderful. Use that to God's glory. Do you have a talent? You're a helper. Good. You just do that again. Sometimes people say, I'm a, I'm a good baseball player, or I like to jump rope, or I'm a good runner. Whatever it is that you do, you want to do it. How many of you are good runners? Well, let's find out. I want you to run back to your seats now. <laughs> Let me see. you got to do the best you can. There you go. Very good. <laughs> the best you can. All right. 
All right, so you have an outline uh, in the, the bulletin there for you. You can follow along, and uh, I just wanted to call your attention to that as we uh, begin. The, the message is going to be coming from two Bible passages, and I'm going to mention those as we begin the message. So uh, if you have your Bibles open, you can kind of go to Thessalonians or go to uh, Matthew, the New Testament, and have those kind of things ready. But uh, I believe they're written down in the in here so you can kind of get a head start. We already prayed that the message was going to be heard and you would have room in your hearts to hear it. And uh, that is part of the, today's theme. You know, I do that every Sunday. It doesn't always happen out loud with you all hearing it, but it happens every Sunday because that's part of wanting to do the best with what God has given me. In an effort to do the best with what God has given me, um, I got a little... Uh, the word over exuberant um, trust me you won't get it all but I have 13 pages of sermon in front of me now, the normal sermon is about three pages okay you're not going to get it all but it was just because I, I really felt convicted of the word of God that says I here's this message that you've heard dozens of times in your life pastor what are you going to do with it and I, I went down several different rabbit holes and, and I learned a, a lot all right, so, but in the heart of the scripture readings today, we're going to find a profound parable and also a focused admission. And admonishing someone usually has two meanings uh, that we kind of carry with us. Sometimes parents admonish their children. It almost sounds like they're punishing them. In a sense, they're trying to guide them. Don't play with fire. Don't smoke. Don't do this. You know, that's admonishing them. Uh, it, but also admonishing can be encouraging. I admonish you to come to church more often. I admonish you to be all that you can be, to do your best, to do your duty, as uh, the Scott Love had. So we're going to have that happening. This is a story that's going to speak of a master and of a servant, of talents given and used on a journey before the master returns. Okay. So ultimately, it's a story at its core about anticipation and preparation. Anticipation and preparation. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to go ahead and open up to the first Bible reading. I'm trying to remember which order I put it in for the PowerPoint guide. All right. It's about, all right, so we're going to go with serving the kingdom. And so this, uh, the gospel lesson comes right after uh, the last one we read last week, which was the, the parable of the ten uh, virgins who were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And it was about being a watchful. So um, I'd like you to go ahead and um, go to the next slide. The epistle lesson talks about Paul talking to the Thessalonians about you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when that time's going to come. And there's some really neat insights as to what's going on there. Uh, we are to encourage one another as we see things coming closer and closer. And so as, but as believers, you might be aware of those things. We're going to find out that non-believers aren't always aware. They may think that things are getting worse and worse, but they don't realize that these things are actually pointing to Jesus coming. But we, we do. And that's an important distinction that we make in today's, today's message. So it's Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. And uh, there's, the best way to go about it is just to go through this, because I'm going to reflect on it later. Concerning the times and the season, brothers, you have no need to have anything written for you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And the idea that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night oftentimes invokes a surprise. And we think, oh, we don't know when it's going to come. I hope I'm ready. But the point of what Paul is making is that if you, we, are watching, when it comes, it will be unexpected. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we're not going to be shocked out of our socks. And, oh my goodness, it's here, I'm not ready. We will have been constantly preparing and watching. We see things going on in this world that the Bible talks about that are going to happen. We're like, it could happen any time now. And we do a self-check and say, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. But we keep watching. It doesn't consume our time, but we're very much aware of it. 
Because there are people in this world that are saying peace and security. That's the people that say, well, life is good. Life is fine. You are too worried about stuff. This happens in the world. There always have been wars and rumors of war. Even the Bible says that. So just relax. Be comfortable. In fact, one of the scholars that made a commentary on this passage says, that's one of the trip hazards of believers. They know the time is coming. They see all of this stuff happening, and they're secure in their faith, and they start to, well, they stop watching. It goes on and says, there's peace and security. Then sudden destruction came upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. They will not escape. But if you are, and, and, and this would be those unbelievers that when it comes, it's too late. But if you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, I just said that. You are all children of the light, children of the day, not of night or darkness. So then, don't sleep like others do, but keep awake and be sober-minded. The idea that we're always aware of what's happening. And it goes on to say for those who sleep. I'm going to jump down to, to verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. If you're underlining stuff in your Bible, that verse 9 and 10 are, are pretty neat. It's kind of like how you need to keep your mind structured and set. Realize it's not about wrath. You're going to hear it at the very end. It's about when God comes, it will be in grace and mercy. And so we're to encourage one another and build each other up. And he tells the Thessalonians, just as you are doing. Just as you are doing. So in the meet, you know, last week, I remember saying something like, let go and let God. How many of you were here last week? Just show a hand, real quick. So you have heard, let go and let God, and you might thought this whole week, boy, they might have thought they don't have to do anything. Let go and let God. He's going to do it all. He's coming. I'll just relax and not do anything. And I thought, I better correct that. Because that's, that's really not exactly what's going on. We let God in control. He's got all power. We're good there. But what are we to do in the meantime is... It's been really plainly uh, put out here in, in God's gospel to us in the book of Matthew, chapter 25. And this is the, the very popular, I call it a popular parable, uh, about uh, the talents of the master. And so what we're going to see is there's a couple insights here that usually I don't, I don't know how many other pastors actually preach on, but it's in there, and it's not hard to find. It seems really much common sense. If you're following along in the Pew Bibles, you can see the page numbers written in your, in your uh, Pew's news, or you can uh, uh, follow along. So he's talking about the kingdom of God. It's going to be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug into the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled an account with them. And you're going to be part of this, just so keep watching. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, talents, and the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had two talents came forward saying, Master, And the master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to put you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, you'd like me to stop this last part because you know your part's coming up and it's not the best part, but here it comes. No. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, yes. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you had scattered no seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. 
His master says to him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I had not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at the coming I should have received what was mine own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten, for everyone who has more will be given, and he who will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, so who's who in this particular message? I'll just spell it out quickly, so if you're following along, you'll be writing a little bit faster in these next uh, five bullet points. The master in the parable is God. God the Father who created the world and created everything in it and said it was good is the God who gives me all things, my body, soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reasons, and all my senses, and he still takes care of them. He's still very involved in our creation. He doesn't, he's not a God who did it and then steps back. The servants are us. We are the servants in this particular parable. The talents are the gifts and abilities that we've been given. Now, I know talents, uh, in this case, were more than likely financial talents. In fact, the commentary written in 1922 said that the talent was probably worth $1,200. So I went ahead and did some uh, calculations and looked online, and I said, what would $1,200 be in 1922 be today? It was something like $22,000. So when he gave that one man five talents, it was like $100,000. And you can do the math for the rest of them. So it was a sizable amount. He gave them money, but also gifts and abilities that we've been given. Now the journey is can be seen as our life on earth, uh, the time that we have in between. We know that the master went away, we think of that as he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father and will come again. So we haven't, this hasn't happened because Jesus is telling the parable, but he talks about this journey. And the return is the second coming of Christ. I told you we're moving pretty quick here. The second coming of Christ. So God has, has, has done that. He set this all up for us. And now here we have the situation. And we understand now what we're called to do. We're called to take our talents and invest them. We're also told to keep our eyes open. So what is coming that, that day of the Lord will not terrify us. But we will be ready for that day when it comes. So just how does that happen, and where do we go from here, I suppose, is the next question. If we're waiting for the return of Christ, and then we have Paul's letter to the Thessalonians saying, you know, you don't have to hurry up, don't worry about that. I suppose the thing is, his meaning is pretty much plain. And that is that he wants us to always watch. Christians' constant attitude is that of vigilance of watchfulness. And this isn't so much that it begins to become a, a neurotic thing where you're all time consuming, always looking up to heaven saying, is it going to be today, Lord? Is it going to be today? I think it's a healthy attitude that we realize that he's going to come again. And when he comes again, he's going to find us. And as the, one of the hymn writers did in our first service, everything that we've done when we get in heaven is going to be shown us. All the things that we've done, both good and bad, is going to be shown us. When I sang that hymn this morning, I kind of got a quiver and a chill up my spine. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's going to be terrible. And a lot of times, preachers don't talk about that. They say, well, you know, don't worry about it. Jesus' blood and righteousness covers it. You're covered. It's, not, it's going to be okay. But the fact that it's going to be shown is, is a pretty daunting thing. It's going to be quite the list, which is sad and, and true to say. So while we're here, we do what we do with what we have. So he wants each of us to invest the talents that he or she has received with all the energy to work unceasingly for his service. That means that your time that you're doing, you give unto the Lord. Your talents, you give unto the Lord. Your treasures, you give unto the Lord. And you do it with excitement and with enjoyment. This isn't something that is, is put out there to be, to be a terrible, awful thing. In fact, one scholar talked about it where they said, you know, you have the first two servants. You give me a hundred grand, by the time he got back, and we don't know how long, 
if you caught that, we don't know when he's coming back. He made a hundred grand more. The other guy, he had what, 40, 45? He's got 90, he comes back, you know, total. It's really a good thing. The other one, we're trying to figure out exactly why in the world did the servant bury his money? Why did he do nothing with it? And, and I really find this fascinating, and it's kind of a new fact for me, although it's been there all the time. People say, you read the same scripture and you come up with something you learned the next time you read it. Well, here it is that this particular servant probably had a perspective on the master that we don't always catch. Notice how he said his answer. He right away began to excuse his answer. Oh, I know that you're a person who doesn't reap where they sow, who wants to harvest where they didn't do any work. I know you're that kind of person, and this is why I did what I did. This particular servant had an attitude, in, in our parabolic kind of saying, of God as a cruel taskmaster, a harsh, judgmental, unmerciful, ungrace-giving being. That's who his Lord, his servant was. And so he feared him and was afraid to do anything, even though he was called to do it. Boy, can you just apply this to your life and I can apply it to mine. Afraid to do it for fear of repercussions from other people. But God called him to do it. And, and so what ends up happening, of course, is that he's condemned for that. You've been given these gifts and abilities, now use them to God's glory. You know, pastors and worship leaders struggle with this a lot. We have people in our congregation that have all kinds of talents and all kinds of abilities. You hear a voice in the back, you're like, that person has a great voice, but they don't sing anywhere else. Why don't they, you know, and you begin to think about that. You know, my wife and I had a mini conversation, I might have been one sided, I'd be doing most of the talking, but. We were t I saw on, on advertising this thing about OCD, obsessive compulsive dis uh, disorder. And I think it's more like OCB, obsessive compulsive behavior. And I thought for a minute, you know, because it, it was a medicine to correct it so you wouldn't be that way. I said, did anybody ever think that maybe there are people in this world that are, can be so incredibly focused so it's incredibly detailed-minded that they help the rest of us who think, I just want to do this big thing. And they go, no, 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 there's all these other things that have to happen. And here we see it as a disorder, but I suppose to the extreme it might be. But what about those gifts and abilities that sometimes we kind of put on a blacklist, but actually they're, they're really can be good things. Each of us has that gift and ability, and, and we're, we're to use those to God's glory, and it's, it's truly an amazing and a wonderful thing. I don't want God to come and find me and say, I gave you the gift of being a pastor and you didn't use it. I gave you the ability of being a husband and you weren't one. I gave you the ability of being a counselor and you kept your mouth closed of song, whatever it is. I didn't give you the desire in your heart to always compare yourself with someone else and say you're not as good a pastor as somebody else or a husband as somebody else or a, or a, or a singer as somebody else and so you shouldn't do it. You're, we're called to do what God has called us to do and to do it for His glory. My doing good things will not remove the red from the water. It won't remove the sin from my heart. Only Christ does that. But it is something that God's called me to do. And as one commenter said, he said, but woe to un the, un the slothful servant that refuses to invest his talent to make use of his gifts and abilities where the Lord has placed him. A real warning. Because when the person is not using it, he's, or she is showing that they're not worthy of the Lord's bounty, and cares nothing for his grace. It's like the servant's attitude towards God. You say, well, I never thought of that, Pastor. Don't preach that to me. Don't tell me when I don't use my gifts and ability, somehow I'm not honoring God. Well, that's what I'm telling you. It's real. And it should be encouraging, not discouraging. 
Eric plays the guitar. Rich plays the drums. Praise God for them. God gave them the talents. It's his talent that he's given them and they use it. And that's what we want to see happen here today. When this commentator saw this, he says the Christ and the apostles cry out, bidding all of us to take heed for that day and watch lest he finds us unprepared. So it's take heed is those words you're putting in there. Be alert, be aware. Use those. Some of you have the gift of gab. <laughs> Some of you have the gift of social networking. Some of you have the gift of, of, of fellowship. Use it. Enjoy it. There are people who just want to sit at the table by themselves, and when you walk up to them and say, yeah, I know you. And I'm glad to be known by you. Let's talk. Because when that happens, when we use what the Lord has given us, and now look at the perspective of waiting and watching until he comes again, therefore those who watch will receive the Lord with grace. We do not need to fear that day that nobody knows that'll come like a thief in the night. Bring it! Because I know I'm covered with his grace and covered with his mercy. But, those who find themselves, that are secure in themselves, will only find a merciless judge. You wicked and slothful servant. Give to someone else the chance to go to fellowship. Give to someone else the chance to go share their gifts. Give to someone else the chance of giving money to the church. Give it to somebody else because they're not going to do it. And by the way, let's take that gift from them and give it to the one who has plenty. Maybe you know someone who's not looking like you're looking, who doesn't see and isn't waiting like you're waiting. Doesn't that make your heart break for them like Paul's? Even with tears in his eyes, he wanted them to know Jesus so badly. So badly. That little statement at the bottom kind of sums it up. For us, it says, there are few excuses so poor and so miserable and sound as those by which professing Christians attempt to evade work in the church. All the more terrible then will the Lord sentence from him that hath, not even that which he hath, shall be taken away. So we use what God has given us. We give him honor and glory. We ask for forgiveness when we haven't used them like we're supposed to, but... True repentance is a change of heart to turn back to do what God has called us to do. I'm going to keep my ears open, and I hope that you'll keep yours open as well. Keep your ears open for someone who walks up to you and says, I, I heard you have this gift. Would you think about serving God and using it? Have your spiritual hearts open, because that might just be the Lord's Spirit working through another person to encourage you to use it and to make ten, five, Two more. So that God will say, Well done, good and faithful. Enter into the joy of your master. To God be the glory. Amen. 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 Now may this good news keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and a life everlasting. Amen. Trust me, you didn't get all 13. <laughs> So the elders have been coming up, and uh, the encouragement of the congregational meeting uh, last time we met was to uh, to bring certain things before us before we give our offerings, tithes, and gifts. And Nathan is here to do just that. There is one question that should be asked of every church to which the answer can be very telling and reveal much. That question is, what if St. Peter's Lutheran Church was no longer in existence? Would anyone notice? In our guiding statement, we say that we are a beacon of the community. If so, how are we sharing the hope and love of Jesus? Each of us has the opportunity to participate in a number of local civic organizations to stay in touch with the community. Its needs, challenges, and efforts. We can volunteer, we can serve, we can provide much needed supplies to those in need. These are very tangible ways for us to be in the hands and feet of Christ to our neighbors. Here is what it may come down to for each of you listening this morning. Am I willing to donate towards the effort?
May I give an extra financial gift to support the worthy cause? Am I willing to give of my time and talents to the worthy cause? Please understand you, the people of God, are called to serve and give of your resources. Not just support, but be a part of the hands-on ministries of St. Peter's. Here's what you can do next. Look. Look for opportunities. Listen. Listen for opportunities. Inquire. Inquire if St. Peter's has the ministry you would like to see happen. If not, consider starting one. If so, then join in. So at this time, we're going to have uh, our offerings brought before the Lord. If you have time for prayer, I'm here to pray with you. Or you can have prayer requests as well. Let's do that now. Stand as we join together in a word of prayer. I didn't see any prayer. Did anyone put any prayer requests in the in the, the, uh, in the plate? Okay, let's go to the Lord. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would guide and protect your church uh, as it endeavors to share the gospel in every circumstances in a world that is living in darkness. I ask that you would embolden the leaders of your church. With conviction, I ask that you open the ears of everyone that they would hear the good news in every circumstances. And I'd ask, even so, that you would grant the increase of faith in the number of people that are gathering, especially here at St. Peter Lutheran. We thank you, Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit to strengthen our congregation as it desires to be a beacon to the community. I ask that you would continue to call on each of every one of our hearts so that we would use those gifts and abilities and talents to celebrate your good news by shining in the darkness of this world. I ask that you would be with the officers of this nation, the armed forces, the police, the fire department, those that are working at home, those that are leading and guiding small and large businesses, those who are working in the media. Uh, give them hearts that would guide, be guided by you. Those who grow and, and distribute food, those who respond to emergencies. I ask everyone that works with the common good, Lord, that you would bless them, protect them, and guide them. I ask that you would grant peace and love to our families. Where there is unrest in our families, Lord, grant rest, grant solutions. May your Holy Spirit infiltrate each and every one's heart so that they would love and respect one another. I ask that you give wisdom to parents as they're eagerly trying to teach and guide the children that you've entrusted to them. I would ask that you would provide faithful congregations to all people who are searching for churches I ask that you would provide caring friends and extended relatives, especially as we prepare to celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday. Watch over us, Lord, and help us live life generously. For the food that we brought, Lord, that, is, that has been presented, whether it's in the galley or, or they still have it, Lord, I ask that you would receive the food that's going to help uh, a family that's in deep need, Lord, and to open the hearts and minds of all of us as we have so much extra. Help us to bring it to church this week so that it can be presented uh, to the family. I finally, Lord, ask that you would, as you are near and dear to us, that you would hear the hearts of each person here as we prepare ourselves to come before you at the table of the Lord. We are ready for your forgiveness. We're ready for strengthening, for word and spirit. We're, we're ready to receive the body and blood of Jesus. And as we do it, we ask that we receive it in faith. As we gather together, we ask that that word of God will infiltrate our hearts. And so that what we receive, we receive forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, strength for our lives. And that what you have given us, Lord, we would receive your well-done accommodation. 
As we continue our prayers, we will now pray the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be praying it in song. So I ask the uh, praise team to come forward as we pray the Lord's Prayer uh, prior to uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup we do proclaim the Lord's death and we pray come Lord Jesus as you have prepared your hearts and minds welcome to the Lord's table. You may be seated. Those assisting can come forward for the first table. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His soul. Thank you. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming to us physically so real that you've assured each and every one of us that our sins are forgiven and that that joy that we have, we can share and we can share also the love that we have in Jesus Christ. And we can keep doing that until your son does return. And then we will be brought to the final destination, wearing the crown of life in heaven. Thanks and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The blessing of our gracious Heavenly Father, a loving Lord Jesus, His Son, and the enlivening of your hope of the Holy Spirit be with and upon each of you now and always. Amen. Our last song is Alive and Breathing, because joy is ours to have now and later. <laughs> Using our gifts and abilities and talents for the glory of the kingdom. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.